Welcome to Council Fire with the Riverwinds. I'm Dr. Larlin Riverwind, and I have brought you down to Georgia, land of the peaches, and I've brought you into the home of one of my very good friends, a peach herself. This is Kathleen Floyd Youngs, and she is my Hebrew teacher. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for having us. Oh, thank you for being here. We love here. you. So it's been a long time since we first met. What year was it? 2005. 2005. It was at Panim El Panim um, with Dr. Howard Morgan hosting. And uh, we just stayed in touch ever since then and have built relationship and really enjoyed just um, – a little bit of iron sharpening iron, but more impartation of love and knowledge and wisdom and hearing each other about different revelations that the Lord's given. So tell us what you are doing lately. Well, um, I'm teaching Hebrew. Um, She is my Hebrew teacher. <laughs> You're going to ask me that. <laughs> keep it. Well, I didn't think about Oh, you're not going to keep that. <laughs> okay, well, um, life is good. I uh, got married almost four years ago, and my son has grown up, moved out of the house, is now in the Marine Corps. And so uh, I've been teaching Hebrew for 12 years. And now is a real opportunity, and I see the Father moving in and, and all of the things that he's placed in my heart that, you know, I've laughed at some of them, but I've watched over these 12 years these things come to pass. And now I think it's time to really hunker down and, um, you know, put the plow to the field that the vision can come forth and this can go out for people. It's a sign. It's a sign, you know. The clock is going off. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, 8 o'clock, too, is the new beginning. And so, um, you know, the vision is for him to overturn this language and bring it to the nations so that they can all proclaim the name of Yahweh with one shoulder serve him. And so what things that were revealed to me years ago are now starting to really make a lot of sense. And I see it as, as I said, time to put our hands to the plow. And there's such a desire out for, for learning the language out there. And, and one of the things that I've seen too is, uh, you know, is just trying to help people understand why do you want to learn the language? So many people have a desire to learn it. And, and I don't know if they're, they're so grounded in it. Some people know why. There was a worldwide almost resurrection of the language that many people don't know about. Back when Israel became a state, there was a real uh, need to help propagate the language and help bring the as much as they could to revive what was almost dead. Right. And it was in agonal breaths, close to death. And so there that resurrection life was, was breathed yes. back into it. Thanks to Eliezer, Eliezer Ben Yehuda. Yes. And um, what a legacy he has left for everyone. So um, the name of your, your business, your ministry, mm -hmm. is? Safa Berova. Safa Berova. The language is so instrumental in the thought process of the culture, is it not? Yes, very affecting. And it's it's really impossible to understand a culture without exploring their language, because it, the thought patterns it, it it's the highways, as you put it. Right. You talk all the time about building the highways when we're in class, right. and the roads and the paths. Talk to us about the, the culture and how it's related to the language. Okay. 
Well, the culture is bound up in the language and the language is bound up in the culture. So they really reflect each other. Like you were saying, they're, they're twined, intertwined together. And it just is, it, it kind of grows out of that. You know, you start with people and they're doing things in a certain way. And, you know, the language just kind of winds with that. It, it travels with that. And of course, if we're talking about the Hebrew culture, we're talking about people who are following the creator and, and the character of the creator and the integrity and the righteousness and the justice. So, um, you know, this is going to be in the language. And this would be... Um, this would be something you could see in a more ancient language. Of course, you know, we have a more modern language that is really reflecting more of the culture as it's becoming today. It's changing. How is it changing? Well, <clears throat> for one, it's, you know, when Eliezer ben Yehuda did a wonderful work when he came to the land and raised a whole generation whose mother's tongue was Hebrew and revived the language and got it established again, once again, once again in the land. This is really not my element. My element is sitting in front of a student with my primer open, but that's okay. We're going to make this work. I'll get comfortable. Um, and, and so then he opened the council of lexicography in Jerusalem and they began creating new words for modern times, ah. you know, and this is going to reflect, you know, we can see the moving away from Yahweh. Okay. And, you know, technology doesn't mean technology has to be away from Yahweh, but the mindset, the fast moving, you know, just the changing priorities, the changing focus or what I know focus to be worship. All right. So the language has changed to the changing culture. And something else that it's done um, is very similar to what we've seen in America called Ebonics. Okay, in Hebrew, there's something that is um, uh, expressing reduction, fusion and reduction, which I have dubbed Hebronics. And it is another language. It is coming out of Hebrew, but it really is another language. I can listen to have a conversation with somebody and they're not they're, they're saying a word to me one of my teachers from Israel uh, we were having a conversation and, and I was talking to her about what I do and some of the artwork I do and and she said the word to me Vring oh Vring you know as I told her my um, and she she said uh, Vring and I said Vring and I wrote on the board B-R-I-M Vring she said no no Devoin well, she cut the whole Dalit out. This is the word Devar, okay? Our master is known as Devar Yahweh, the word of Yahweh. Devar is a word or a thing. She's, you're making things, right? And to me, that is very um, alarming that we would lose the door of the word word when our Mashiach is the word. Okay, and it just that's just a little example, but those kinds of things were very um, uh, uh, perplexing to me. And so, uh, you know, um, there is a passion in my heart to, you know, maybe continue in some sort of way. And I think there are a lot of people on the globe, at least a lot in the remnant, a lot of people who feel like I am, which I could say was probably more than one handful. That's a lot of people. Okay, we, we think in terms of remnant that are on this same path, that are wanting to preserve a, a beautiful, uh, you know, to, a holy, um, a pure lit, uh, where it's not changing into something else, where we're articulating. I just can't imagine the Messiah coming in and speaking Hebrew so fast that everything molds together and things fall off. You know, like I said, fusion and reduction, Hebronics. Well, because he's, he talks about not letting any bit or piece of it right. fall away that it's supposed to be preserved in its exactness because he is an Elohim of the details. Right. You know, the devil's not in the details. No, it's part of the beauty of his holiness too. The beauty of his set apartness. And, and it's something to be handled in that way. We want the fullness. We don't want just parts and pieces. I, I, I want all. So when you talk about the Hebronics, 
what what type of uh, Hebrew do you teach? Well, I teach what is known as Sephardic Biblical Hebrew. And it's actually a modern Biblical Hebrew. And that could be um, from the time of Daniel in Babylon. Uh, 450, no, 586 years, I think, before Yeshua um, walked on the planet, but um, in the body of a man. Um, you know, there is ancient Hebrew that I think only Yeshua is going to be able to reveal to us. Sometimes you get far enough away from something and and you know, so it's it's um, uh, I think maybe a little elusive to people when you say modern biblical Hebrew. Yeah, because I know that what you teach me includes the Paleo Hebrew right. letters and things like that. But there's an ancientness that somehow has been lost, and that's part of that restoration that you were talking about in Zephaniah three nine, where he says he'll restore the pure lip. Right. And we're doing the best we can to restore to some to our best of our ability, but the rest of that has to come from him. It does, and we're kind of going in the circle. You know, it's the circle of life. We go out, and then we start coming back. And I think that heading for the modern biblical Hebrew is in the right direction going back because we say, well, let's go back and let's get what we still do have, what is still preserved. And the Holy Spirit is not slack to be able to to take us to, to new heights and and that's what he wants. But, um, you know, the modern Hebrew, it serves its purpose. I'm not saying anything is wrong about that. I don't think that what I do is right and what other people do is wrong. This is just what I've been called to, is the Sephardic Biblical Hebrew is what was used, uh, is what Eliezer ben Yehuda used. It was what has been used in the synagogue services, and I'm talking of ancient time. Um, so it and is different the, than Ashkenazi versus Yeah, yeah that's Ashkenazi. like two different dialects. They use the same letters. They, you know, some of the, the pointings, the, the vowels or the dots and dashes, the nekudot, um, they would pronounce them differently because of that. Even though you can have a scroll and it could, a Sephardic person could read it, it would sound like this, and an Ashkenazi would read it, and it would sound like this. The, the language is the same. It's just a dialect and a pronunciation. Some oys and some, you know, s's. Uh oh -ohs. Right, right. Yeah. So um, the uh, the modern Hebrew um, is, you know, it's fit for modern times. And one of the... the and that would be what, different than conversational? Com I would call that conversational. Or, okay. Modern, com yeah, thank you. Conversational Hebrew is for just that. And it's a very westernized. It's very for this day. But I believe that there is um, uh, a need or a desire even to go ahead and go back and start using the, the biblical Hebrew for conversation, for so, daily use, because that's what Eliezer ben Yehuda did. So if you're in Hebrew and you've learned biblical Hebrew, is it a little akin to somebody who speaks conversational Hebrew in Israel hearing uh, like what today we would hear somebody from the 1600s with the King James English type is there somewhat you know there's there's better articulation like I said that the things aren't chopped up um, and uh, you know sometimes you'll say words to people that are younger in Israel and they'll say oh what, what's that word or people who aren't younger they say oh that's a word we don't use because they've replaced these God centric scriptural words that carry a context of you know um, creator and his his doings with man that we see in scripture from Genesis to Revelation okay so they're what I kind of call God centric God centric and so they don't the modern words they've made up the <coughs> modern words to replace Bible words because these are you know his name is wonderful Nifla okay so you use wonderful in conversational and they say oh that's ancient I, it really moves them but my heart is to say hey let's start getting ready for the coming messiah let's make our language fit what we're what we're expecting what we're waiting to come and that is him ruling on the earth and the secular goes out the window and now everything is about him he's in the middle again he's in the center so why wouldn't we want to begin to um steer our language in that direction kind of pick up, you know, where Eliezer ben Yehuda left off and bring that Sephardic Biblical Hebrew back 
um, into the community, into our communities, and begin to, to use that. So why, why would somebody spend all of the effort and time to learn Hebrew if they can just look it up in the Strong's? Well, um, you know, I started there looking it up in the Strong's, and um, you know, after I learned more about Hebrew, I realized the Strong's is a very um, young, it's a very immature work. It's not even 200 years old. Okay, while it's a, in a while, language that is a baby infant stage. While he's, uh, it's an amazing work. I don't want to um, take away from the work that he did and what he put into it. And you know what? I mean, I even still do use the Strong's for some things, but it's kind of a stepping stone to get somewhere else. And you know, I have come to a place where I want to go back to, and this is actually where I was when I started. I wanted to be taught by people whose mother tongue was Hebrew, who were native Israelis, and. Um, and so there is a stream that I got into because of that. And, um, uh, you know, I've come to even finding the dictionary that is written by Hebrew people, Hebrew speakers, to get back to the basics. You know, there's a lot of cloudiness. There's just, it's very, um, uh, it's just all over the map. It could mean this, 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 this. And it goes off into a lot of places. And I'm, I'm sort of black and white. And I want to come and I want to find the essence of the root and then let the spirit show me. And, and this is something about the Hebrew scriptures is that um, God repeats himself over and over and over again. He'll use the same word again and again and again and again. In the creator's native tongue, that's proper grammar. In English, that's not proper grammar. Okay, so there's a, a plethora of words in English to... Um, fit the occasion that the word is being used for. In Hebrew, what I found to, to work for me is that when a word is used again and again, no matter if it's used here or if it's used here, the context is going to give me the fullness of what he's saying. I can use the same word and have the same root essence, but the context is going to fill it in because it's a contextual language. It's all about concept. It's not always like a one word translation like what we want to do in English. A good example of that is the word you used earlier, which is davar. Word, or thing. Mm -hmm. And everything is a word, every word is a thing. Hey. <laughs> so, yes. So you mentioned how you like to learn from native Hebrew speakers. Mm -hmm. That the those who Hebrew is their uh, native tongue. But I'll tell you, I have found great value in learning from you, right. even though that's not your first language. And for me, that's an excellent place to start in my mind because you knowing what my mindset is coming from uh, English being my first language, you know what the obstacles and pitfalls are going to be, you know what issues of mindset and philosophy and background come with the what what the baggage of our language and culture is when approaching Hebrew and to me that's an excellent way to begin and so um, I'm I value the fact that you as a non-native speaker are my first teacher of Hebrew so that I can understand what the pitfalls are to look for and what and also you have all of these what you call ditties and my ditties and my songs mm -hmm. yes that help memory me. devices mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that make it fun yes and stick in your head and help you mm -hmm. learn quicker mm -hmm. and so those I found to be of great value to me well you know and that's good and, and I'll tell you when I started out on this journey in learning Hebrew I, I, I mean it wasn't like I took the bull by the horns and said hey I'm gonna learn from native speakers my first teacher was not a native speaker okay um, and I should say at, but at a certain point uh, when I turned to Israel the teachers in Israel I wanted native speakers okay um, when I would listen to it because I was immersing myself I would listen to it I wanted to listen to native speakers now, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> um, there were things that I learned from my teacher in Israel, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a base thing of the earth that God's doing great things with. He's called me to be a senior instructor at, instructor at Safa Be'eruvah. It started out with, with a desire, a longing, a hunger that 
just captured me to learn Hebrew in the beginning, but it, it turned into something else, you know, me teaching other people Hebrew, and then me teaching other people to teach Hebrew, okay? So, um, you know, you're exactly right, and I will stand with you on that, because there are, all, just like you said, and I say this on my website, why would you want to learn from someone in America, or someone who's maybe a mother's tongue isn't Hebrew, is because I do know all the pitfalls. I've been able to go out and learn from my Hebrew teachers. They could not see the problems or the obstacles that I was hitting. But he called me to do this, and so he showed me. I was able to, as I was working it out and learning, um, some on my own and then with my teachers, I was working, and I was seeing where did I get stuck, what caused me problems, and so once I got through that, with the ahas, like, oh, hey, now I see how I can help people learn this quick and simply without going through the trenches that I had to go through to get it. Um, so there's a definite advantage. It's good to move after they graduate with you. It's good to move then to a, he a native Hebrew speaker to learn finessing how yeah. they do, you know. I honestly, you know, I, I don't want to talk bad about any of the other schools. Of course, I'm biased to stuff I be able to um, but I wouldn't recommend other people to do what I did. That's what I meant by I was called to this, and I think that I went, what I went through was very helpful for me to be able to teach people and to teach teachers to teach people because um, it just makes more sense because our minds are working in this way. Their minds aren't working the way in the language of English that, that ours do. So we can we can maneuver through it and say, you know, this is this is what you want to see. I know that if when, that makes any sense, I hope it does. When I was learning Spanish, uh, I learned from different Spanish teachers. First, I learned actually I can't even remember the order, but I want to say first it was an English speaker who had learned Spanish and then I learned from a Spanish speaker who was from Mexico and a Spanish speaker who was from Puerto Rico and a Spanish speaker who was from Spain and so I had all of these different perspectives and a lot of different people mm -hmm. telling me and there there was a, an element of confusion until I came to the point where I understood where they were all coming from right. and the different aspects and it gave gives you a more well-rounded yes. understanding of it. But I want to give, um, I'll, let's give some examples of some of your ditties. Um, the first one that comes to mind is, he is she and, uh, who is he who and is he, he and she, he is she. Yeah, who is he and he is she and me is who, but that comes later. <laughs> so what that means, who is he? The word who in Hebrew means he in English. The word he in Hebrew means she in English. The word me in Hebrew means who in English. So who is he and he is she and me is who. When it makes everybody laugh, it's a song. We can learn songs. And so I start that out before we're even learning any any uh, vocabulary. It's in a uh, the chapter where we're learning how to read. Um, you know, another one is Aleph is if and I'm is with. All if is if and ein is with in. That's right. There, it's a homonym. Yeah. So you know, one is spelled with an alf, one is spelled with an i. All if is if and ein is with. <clears throat> so. So those are the type of things that made it so much easier to, to remember. And of me. course, I hear those songs going through my head yeah. all the time. I'm doing my homework. <laughs> and you have a new one recently too. Vayo, Mary. Vayo. <laughs> that was my teacher. Vayo, Mary Kathleen. Vayo. <laughs> Well, I love the ditties, they help. Why don't you teach, give us a taste. Give us a taste of Hebrew. Okay, what I'm going to do here, because we talked a little bit about, um, you know, modern, and you mentioned paleo. Uh, because you can write in paleo, and I think we hit it, about what is modern biblical Hebrew. Um, and, you know, we do teach at Safa Bebuwa, in our course, we teach uh, paleo script, we teach Babylonian script, and we teach cursive script. So you, you'll have, uh, what, what our desire is for you to have a good platform. When you go through 101, hopefully 201, 
you have all the basic grammar of Hebrew. When you have that, you can go anywhere. You have a platform. You know all the grammar rules. Now what you do, say you wanted to go now, you wanted to learn conversational. You have an amazing vocabulary already for reading the scriptures because the book that we use, the primer that we use, uh, you get 333 words that are the most used words in the Bible. So you have a very good foundation for going out and reading the Bible. And first and foremost, that's really what our our goal is here, is to equip people to be able to go out into the scriptures and commune with the, the Creator through the Word. I found the, when I pulled my lexicon out that having just finished 101 with you, I've been surprised at how much I can so read and the understanding that you have. And then the cursive, you know, the cursive, Hebrew cursive script is very interesting. You would think it would be a modern because that's what they use in modern day. We write letters with it. We make grocery lists. They uh, Actually, uh, the, the story here is that, you know, what we're going to teach you, the cursive, the, you cannot really date the cursive. It is very ancient, which is very interesting. Um, but, you know, when I went to Israel um, years ago, I thought, well, I don't really need to practice that much cursive that much and and golly jeepers I got off the bus and there was a billboard in cursive and I said I hey you know this is really really important um, while we focus mostly on the Babylonian we do teach the paleo one and the paleo was like those books when we were children learning English you get a picture of a ball you remember that very well when you have a picture so putting the the picture with the other symbol of the Babylonian and then also the cursive, you know, it really gives, like we were talking about, that fullness. You have grounding. You have a lot of different things. It's something in there you're going to associate with and remember. It's not going to be just a bunch of stale symbols that don't mean anything that you've got to actually memorize this. There's a story to it. There's a life to it. So the and paleo, and, and then the paleo is just fun, and we're going to do that here in a second. But, you know, it's very important um, I believe to get all three scripts and and I don't want you to be intimidated by that because we have to learn four for English You've got upper and lower case up uh, uh, cursive and print. You've got um, Upper and uh, no upper and lower case handwriting and you've got upper and low, lower case printing So that's four for English that we learned as little children. This is not hard This is actually more fun and it's more simple now um, a lot of times you'll tend to drop the cursive off, as I'm a really good example of that in the past. Um, but we learn it well enough, you can always pick it up. It's it's in there. It's it, it, You can always bring it back. So yeah. what I'd like to do now is, um, now I do some of this in class. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to just kind of look at a little story in the paleo um, that's hopefully going to bring some practical application of um, the word to life. Um, with using just one word, and we're going to look at the word shalom. Which is many really people fun. have seen this done in paleo before, but there are a lot of different interpretations that you can get from use working with the paleo. Hebrew. Sure, you can. And so this is maybe one that you've never heard before, right? And what when when we teach the paleo in this course, um, you know, in the the um, uh, possible interpretations for each of the letters you know you'll get you'll get a word picture meaning you'll you'll get you'll you get a symbol okay which is the picture you get a, a, a what it means what it actually is like this is a house um, or a tent and then what it can be interpreted as we kind of give you just a jump start all right that it's, it's not the fullness of it and there's more things that it can be interpreted as and it's, uh, like I said, it's a jump start. Now, you've got this start. You go on and you you build it. You you seek him. And you, you let that be built into you. I am just cracking up. I love your pointer. My yacht. This is a yacht. Look at this. This is a back scratcher. My father would love this. But she's cut these things off. <laughs> that is so cute. This is for when I do classes in person across the table because I can reach you over there. <laughs> Actually, I could read your book without having to climb over the table and point right where I want, which this is great. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the word shalom. All right. And uh, this is spelled, here are our Babylonian letters, sheen, lamed, wal, Mem. And this spells up the word shalom. All right. These are our paleo letters. These are teeth. This is a shepherd's staff. This is a nail, and this is water. 
These are the paleo word pictures here. So that's interesting. There are some people who, like right here, they froze. A what? A wow, okay. The, the wow is a more antiquated pronunciation for what is commonly known now as the vav. Right, so it can be a wow, it can be a vav, but I choose to go with the wow. Uh, actually, I give it. I give my students the um, the choice. Do you want to pronounce this as a wow? Do you want to pronounce it as a vav? I think. And then all the lessons after that, she's consistent with. You're consistent with how it, it's done, and so whatever they choose, you follow through. With. Right, because it's not. I'm not going to say, hey, if you're wrong if you say vav. Or you're right if you say wow. No, I'm just going to say wow is more antiquated. Vav is perfectly fine to use. It's your choice. And um, I noticed another difference when I began learning with you. And that's, for example, that one. The may. I had learned as mem. Mm -hmm. And you told me the more antiquated way to pronounce it is main. Well, it, it's actually, it's, you know, when we talk about nekudot or the vowel pointings, we know the vowel pointings were conceived about a thousand years after Yeshua's resurrection. Um, by the Masoretic group of people in Tiberias. Um, in fact, there's even a, a museum now. I'd love to go there. The language was a spoken language before that. You learned from people you associated with, that you had relationship with. Once they made the vowel pointings and then you were able to write them without compromising the order of the letters. That's why they're placed on the bottom, in the, in the center, over the top in the middle of, you don't have to compromise the order of the letters by putting them in. But this is a work of man. I believe it's an inspired work. But there doesn't mean that we can't have little places where there may be some discrepancy or questioning of, of what that is. Now, nuances. nuances. Okay, thank you. Um, but there are two vowels, the tsele and the segol. And I believe over time, they're very, very close. Eh, a. Eh. It depends on where they are in the word, how close they sound to each other. But they've actually come to say in the modern Hebrew, these letter, these vowels make the same sound. Well, I'm going back again, just as I went back with the wow. I want to go back with this because there, like I said, there are times these two vowels sound so much alike, but there are very certainly two different vowels. And so mem, what a lot of people know as mem or bet is actually Bates or Main, uh, because it is a Tseri that is spelled with. Um, so yeah, there are little things like that. And again, I'm not saying anybody, you're wrong for saying that this way is right. Uh, we're just wanting to preserve, and, and if we find an antiquated ways of doing something, uh, you know, for me, I, I'd like to choose that. Preser preserving. Right. Can it? Pass it on to the next generation. Right. You know, it's just like righteousness. We're, we're passing down to our children. We better not lose it or who will know Yahweh? We can't lose that. We can't lose that. Okay, so um, so, so we see the teeth. Uh -huh. We see the teeth. We see the shepherd's staff. We see the nail. We see the water. Okay, and what I want to point out is that um, shalom is known as peace. Okay, uh, what we see as peace. But what is peace? Right. Um, one of the interpretations for these paleo word pictures for the teeth, it could be destroy, consume, press, destroy. It's like chewing your food. Um, the shepherd's staff can be interpreted as authority. The nail can be interpreted as it's the word and in Hebrew and to hook something to secure it. OK, and water. We see water in the word as something very, very good. Um, you know, the knowledge of Yah will cover the earth like the seas. We're to wash our minds in the water of the word. So uh, in Romans 11, we see that there is a goodness and a severity to Yahweh. Okay, and that shows up here in the word peace, in the word shalom. We'll come down here. If we have doubts... Where does that come from? Fear. And fear is not from Yah. He did not give us a spirit of fear. And we can come into anxiety over this. And this is really what we're doing. We're doubting him. We're allowing a spirit of fear in. And it's creating anxiety within us. This is directly opposed to the substance of our creator. All right? These are things that cause turmoil. It's like a... Um, 
antithetical to his purposes and his desires. If we look over here under water, the goodness, we see trust, safety, rest. This is his desire for us. All right. When we are not hooked to the authority, when we're not trusting in him, we're not resting and we're, we're not seeking him for safety, but we're getting into our own self governance even or believing something other than, than doing something other than ruthlessly believing the word we have a lot of circumstances and situations in life where we must ruthlessly believe the word put on our faith glasses and trust him otherwise if we look at the situation doubt can come in because the spirit of fear will set up we'll get into anxiety he doesn't have to decide oh gee they're getting off i'm going to send turmoil it just happens it's antithetical to what he's doing over here so what happens is is in this in these practices we are not hooked to our authority so something becomes missing something becomes broken and it's the continuity of his desire his trust his safety his rest his shalom that he wants to give us so we need to be hooked to the authority and we need to Ask maybe next well, well, how do we get that way? What hooks us to the authority? It's um it's a it's a fullness again, it's it's obedience, it's being loyal to him in his word, obeying the commandments, trusting him, and doing what he says we need to do, and we do it out of love and loyalty and trust, and that way we have shalom. When we are hooked to the authority, then the severity of Yah will work against those things that are coming against us trying to move us out into doubt, trying to get us snagged by the spirit of fear, trying to get us to fall into anxiety, all right? That's what that severity will work against if we work against it also. And if we embrace the trust, the safety, the rest, we will have nothing missing, nothing broken. We will have perfect peace being hooked to our authority. And that is my look at Shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Inside, outside. He's willing and wanting to put that perimeter around us and be severe to those things that would come against us. But when we have it within our own self, that severity is going to come against us. It's going to cause us to lose our peace. So if we want to keep our peace, we ruthlessly believe. We trust and seek Him for our safety and rest in that. I love how you talk about Maine because most of the people I've heard discuss it only talk about one aspect of it and that's the, the chaos. chaos and what I teach people and I probably got this from you or either Frank Sinkins, Dr. Mm -hmm. Frank Sinkins, yes. um, is that each letter has both a kingdom of light and a kingdom of dark that's misunderstanding. Right. And so, depending on the context of the letter, is going to be what which aspect we choose. That's great, and I love it because it ties right in. When we're nailed to our authority, we're going to have that flow from that letter coming. What's our mindset? What's our heart set on? What's our what is our heart really thinking? Yeah. How? how what stream are we in with this? When we're when we're hooked to our authority, it turns those waters of chaos into that stream of living water, water the still waters that he leaves us by it looks at that those waves that peter was being consumed by and overtaken by and instead that calm tranquil waters that he leads us by when we're hooked to that authority and it's work it's work it's a war mm -hmm. but it's a good fight yeah so what would you tell someone who may be a little intimidated or feel like they can't learn another language? Maybe they've never tried before. Maybe they've tried and that grade was their lowest grade in school. What, what would you say? Oh, I have a lot to say to them. I just want to tell them to take heart and be encouraged. And a lot of it is in their mind. Okay. Now I've had people come to me and say, oh, I have tried to learn Hebrew three times. And I look at them and say, you haven't studied with me or my teachers okay um, this is a very non intimidating course that's the very and truth. It, that is very true you know I'm a, what you would call a yellow personality my driving core motive is fun and um, you know I, uh, I I don't see myself as this um, 
scholar or intellectual person, you know, the language is going to, um, let me say this, the language is gonna, gonna take us there. We, heroes again, where we wanna trust God. If there's a desire in our heart, let not anything hinder you, okay? Break through, step out and, and try it, okay? And, and don't ever give up because that's what the enemy wants to do. This is God's will. Zephaniah 3.9 says he's going to turn to the nations of your lip. So if it's his will, who's working against that? Kathleen, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us that breakdown of Shalom. Um, will you tell us, okay, what would you say to somebody who maybe does not feel languages are their thing. They don't, they've never learned another language or they tried Spanish in school. And or trip over English. You know, what would you say? Okay, I would just say be encouraged. And, you know, this has been a big part of my role as a Hebrew teacher is, is trying to woo people in and to help them get over those hurdles that are, you know, in front of them, keeping them, you know, hindering them from um, doing something that is God's will. And it is God's will for us to learn Hebrew, Zephaniah 3, 9 tells us. So, you know, I've had people come to me and say, oh, I've tried to learn Hebrew three different times. And I tell them, well, you haven't studied with us yet at Safa Um I've had people say, well, I, I'm just not good with, with language, you know. And, you know, over the years, the 12 years that I've been teaching, I've had of all my students, I've, I'll be honest, I've had about five people who were really proficient in English, and I'm not one of them, okay, um, come through my course. And I've actually learned from them, which is really great because then I can pass that on to my students. But the Hebrew language, learning Hebrew, is it has taught me grammar, okay? And people get scared when you say grammar. It's like, who, who, who. Um, I was like that. Grammar in Hebrew is about learning how to be led by the Holy Spirit. I call these golden nuggets that I'll be teaching. And, you know, the, the master is flowing, the anointing is flowing, the master is speaking, and I'm going, wow, this is really great. You know, he's teaching us. But these golden nuggets will come up, and I'll see it, how the grammar says, wow, that's how the Holy Spirit teaches us to move like this. And you'll you'll learn more detail about that in the class. But the thing of it is, is... Um, this is a non-intimidating course. In fact, I get kind of goofy to the point <laughs> where people can feel comfortable. Like, hey, you're sitting down with a real person. Um, we're just here to have fun. We're going to learn it. It, it. I was so intimidated in my classes in, in Israel. It's just, you know, it's, it's amazing. I learned what I learned. Um, you know, we try to keep the classes to a minimum number of people because it's like I say, nobody gets left behind. Um, and there's you a, also do one on one. I do. You sure? Which I have left. Absolutely, one on one, and I and like I said, I try to keep it because you know nobody left behind. That means a lot. It's like you, you're paying for a class. Are you getting what you're supposed to be getting each time? Now you have to do your work, okay? But this. But I've never gotten in trouble when my homework was late. So. <laughs> We can frame her homework and put it in a museum, okay? This woman is amazing. Um, you know. It's it's asking yourself, hey, is this the season for me to do this? And you know, I'll I'll walk with you through the warfare. It's part of the beginning of the class, um, you know. And the the primer kind of eases you in to where you can start making it a part of your life. And then you're just going to be captured. And I'm going to tell you that that Hebrew is not English. English is a borrowed language. It's a perverted language. It's a, Excuse me, because I think there's good things about English, but English is a mess when you compare it to Hebrew. Hebrew is a pure lip, and of course, Yeshua will restore that pure lip to us. But you will learn grammar just by learning Hebrew, and it's it's in a context, or it's down in a setting of fun stuff. Hey, here's a word picture. Hey, we can we can learn words now. We, you know, so. Um, don't be intimidated. You won't be in this class. And, and if you are, it may be something inside of you. And I'm just going to say to you, there's a lot more that goes on in these classes than just learning Hebrew. 
uh, the, the Holy Spirit moves in the language. I Here's another one that's really neat. There's been a lot of people come through class that were uh, dyslexic, that had dyslexia. <laughs> Say it for me, which please? Dyslexia. Okay, yeah, that thing. Um, or speech impediments. <laughs> well, the <laughs> dyslexia, kidding. it just vanishes in the Hebrew. They don't have any problems with that. It, you know, I can see it because I can see a lot of things when you teach people a language. You can see a lot of things that people don't even see. Um, how your mind works, how, how you're thinking. A lot of it is how you're thinking about yourself. Well, love yourself with this. Gather up the courage and come and learn Hebrew. Um, I've seen things turn. One of the things that I, I think it may have been you who said this to me when you talked about the fact that some people with dyslexia have had no problem with Hebrew and that it, that there's a theory that um, it could be because their brain naturally thinks from right to left and is being forced into a left to right. And so when they start to study a language that's in the reverse, mm -hmm. in the reverse, uh, it actually yeah. is more natural for them to be able to flow that way, and so they don't have the problems that they encounter with English right. and other languages. And if, if you are a Messiah, you have the seed of the word in you, the, the seed of Abraham, it's already in there. We're just going to pull it out. And God's going to bring healing in many, many areas of your life when you learn Hebrew. It's not just an academic um, excursion. This is a life-changing communion with Creator, and that's another passion of mine. I believe on Mount Sinai, He wanted to have a personal relationship through the Ruach HaKodesh, through the Holy Spirit, with each and every person in the nation. And they said, no, just Moses, you go talk to Him and tell us what He said. Now it's time for us to do what Yah desired on Mount Sinai and begin to seek Him on our own in the Word and let the Holy Spirit translate for us. You know, there's something about um, going into the Word and what what I'm bent on in, in the way that I teach and the way that I've been learning and the way that I teach is that you read what it says. It's not about um, going into the Hebrew so that you can put it into English grammar. We are sourcing Hebrew and we are targeting Hebrew. In other words, oh, we, we talk Tarzan, uh, it kind of sounds that way, because we want to see what does the Hebrew say, and I will teach you, read what you see, get the fullness of the whole sentence, and then let the spirits, what are you hearing inside of your spirit now? What is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? What do you hear in that? It's, um, it's not going to be a reflected revelation, which is which is good. We, it's good that we have people sharing their revelations with them. With, with the, that's what I'm doing now. But it's going to be like the sun. The moon is direct light or indirect light. The sun is direct light. When you go and you learn Hebrew yourself and you begin to read in the scriptures, you're going to be getting directly from Creator through the Holy Spirit. One of the things that I love about the Hebrew class is that it has... Um, taken me in, into a whole new level of my relationship yeah. with the Lord. And it's also taken me into a different place where I don't have to rely on somebody else's interpretation of the Lord, of the word in order to understand what scripture is saying. And that has been priceless to me. And I want to thank That's, you as yeah. my Hebrew teacher huh. for giving that to me. And I always... You know, in the years that I've known you, the first time you started kind of putting the seed in my ear about it, um, about learning Hebrew, I always said, I, I just don't have time right now. I don't have time right now. But what you said about the way that the primer works is that it leads you into that. And so at the beginning, mm -hmm. I only had a smaller amount of time that I was able to devote. And as long as I could carve out that bit... We were good, and I could progress. And I just took my flashcards, and you'd be surprised how when you're in the middle of cooking dinner, you can grab the flashcards and go through them, and you've just memorized three more of I'll this. I'll make a lot of suggestions for you how to work it into your life. 
And at some mm -hmm. point, and I don't know where that transition happened, but at some point I began to carve out time from some of the things that really were not so important in my life. That's right. And that's it. And Carving began, it out. I began to prioritize because it's mm -hmm. being able to prioritize learning the Word of God. And that's more important. And so uh, it's amazing how when you begin to prioritize Him, He will order your time in a way yes. that you can. When it's giving of time to him. Much like guarding the feast. Mm -hmm. We're guarding the feast, we can find we have more time for things. Mm -hmm. And learning Hebrew is part of our study of the word, which some say is the highest form of worship. Mm -hmm. Okay, one of that. You know, there's uh, you know, a carving out in our lives. You, 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 you said it, and I've seen that with so many people where we don't have the time in the beginning. Can you give us... An example and if you can't think of one off the top of your head I have one for you to share um, of, of how our understanding of Scripture is affected by language interpretation in the Bible the one that comes to mind for me is Abraham what what Yah said to Abraham after Isaac. Okay, yeah. This, and this is part of talking what I call, I'm goofy, right? Talking Tarzan, okay? Because people want to make it sound good in English. It's like, no, just talk Tarzan, okay? There just is a translate what's there. Just read what you see and make sure you go to the end of the sentence. Otherwise, your mind's going to not be work. It's gonna, anyway, it's going to try to do it in English, and we're not targeting English. We're going to speak in English words, but we're targeting Hebrew. So in uh, Genesis 22, Bereshit 22, um, the Malach Yahweh is having a conversation with Abraham. So the messenger. The messenger. Uh, that's right. The messenger of Yahweh or the angel of the Lord. Um, that's the English translation of this. Uh, is having a conversation with Abraham. And um, this was really beautiful for me. Uh, because, you know, I hear the words, Yah is uh, omnipotent, He is omniscient, He is omnipresent. And I'm like, okay, I know what that means. Like, okay, and I have this finite understanding of what that is because that's who I am. But uh, it says to, he says to him, uh, and this is after Abraham has put Isaac on the altar. He's taken up the, the machpelet, the knife, and he hears, Abraham, Abraham. Don't put a hand on the young man. And he says to him, now, all right, catch this. Now I knew you will not withhold your son, your only. And I've seen that. And, you know, it kind of soaked in oh, a year, two years, how, how much time went by. And I went back to it and I, and I saw that, you know, Yah is omnipresent and he could quite have possibly seen Abraham carry it out because what's Abraham going to do? Okay, I'm glad they believe me now. I'm going to do this. I'm really going to do this. Did Yeshua possibly come back over here because he saw Abraham carry out the slaughtering of Isaac and come back here? to where Abraham was in time and said, Abraham, Abraham, now I knew you will not withhold your son. They do not translate it like that. They translate it in how we would speak in English for people who are not omnipresent. It does not take us into the um, dimension of, of God in English. Because in But if you read what you see in Hebrew, it is going to transcend that dimension and you're going to get a glimpse if you just open up and let it flow don't be afraid this is fun don't let anything stop you there is a whole other world out there that you are not seeing in english and you're seeing it through the eyes of somebody else's interpretation which your interpretation or your translation is going to come through your eyes okay but you will not see these things and this is precious this takes deeper meaning into the heart of Abraham, the desire of Yah, 
the magnificence and how we can magnify him. Then when I saw this, I said, oh, I magnify the Lord. Because the more I learn, the stupider I get. <laughs> the more I learn, the more I realize I there's so much more I don't know. And when he, when I can get a glimpse by just being childlike, not being too intellectual, just simply look at it and see what does it say. Let y'all repeat himself over and over and over again. Let the context show you what it's saying. Just push the English aside. We're going to use English words, but we're going to just keep it simple. And, and just let the Spirit reveal to you what it is that's really being said. It's one of the things I say. Come learn with, with us and learn how to read what it really says. And this is like, it's like popcorn. Woo, woo, look at this, you know, it's all over. It's all over. Thank you for asking me that question. And one of the things I love about the, um, that sentence, the way that it's translated, is that you see three times. T three time frames. You now. see mm -hmm. present tense. Mm -hmm. Now. You see past I knew. tense and you see future you will and not. it's the mm -hmm. i was i am i will be and i'm and in all places at once and it's the um i also see a picture of the courtroom of heaven yeah. and and the fact that the lord knew what he would choose ahead of time but he had to put him to the test to have the evidence in the courtroom of heaven that go. he had the faith that he would do what he was required to do or asked of to do in obedience and that the faith in the resurrection the faith would be accounted un unto him as righteousness judicially mm -hmm. like you said judicially he is the, the righteous judge. judge it has to be that way so what you know some people might look at me and say oh that just sounds really silly the way you're translating that but uh you might look at it and see how Deep, it will take you into something you've read again and again and again and never heard that. Yes. Well, in wrapping up, I want to say I love the format that you use when you do this. You don't have to be present in Georgia to be able no. to learn from you. I learn from the planet. you halfway across the nation. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an online format that has interactive um, let, let, let me say this because this is a question I get. It is live face-to-face -face classes where I can write on the board. You can see it. I can see all the expressions on your face. And you can see the expressions on mine. Sometimes you can even hear my heartbeat because my, my mic works so good. But it, and, and the neat thing with doing it online, I, you know, I was worried about the anointing, um, you know, being watered down. But it's not. We're face-to-face. -face. We're on the same Time. Panim el panim. Panim el panim. And the neat thing is about doing it online that we can't, we don't do this when it's live classes is that it's recorded. So you can go, you can watch it again. If it's a, if it's a group class and somebody has to miss, mind you, has to miss, you can make it up the next day. Okay. And still stay up with the class. And you know, it doesn't put a pressure on the teacher to have to redo it again and, and, and have extra time slots. Um, although we're willing to go where we need to go for our students because no one gets left behind. So check out the online, we've, we've got the link up there so that you can go and check online. And there are different um, offerings that she has, whether it be a class that has multiple people in it, a classroom type of situation, which is less expensive, or a face-to-face um, -face private, private class, private class. Mm -hmm. and there, there's also the possibility of a subscription class coming yeah, up. We, we do. We're piloting a program for those that might not have very much time or resources, and we want to provide this for people, um, you know, how, whatever they can afford, whatever time that they have to afford. And something that's not necessarily, uh, it, it's more flexible for schedules where you can't be there at a certain time. Exactly. You can go to it when you need to, etc. cetera. So right. that's a you great can, You option. can run the train on that one. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you, Kathleen, so much. Thank you. I want to honor you as my teacher. And I want to thank you for everything that you've given me and, and for the relationship that you have with me. I love you. And um, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Well, bless you. <laughs> thank you for, 
for following your heart and, and stepping forward and or follow his heart. That's right. Well, they're they're one in the same. His lady. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So it's a blessing to be here, and I'm honored to to um, be able to pour out to people um, that step up to the plate and say, "Hey, I want to learn Hebrew." And, and you know, once they start, they're they you know. It's pretty good statistics. Addicted. You get hooked. Yes. It changes your life. Addictive. And it, you know, it gives you substance in, in places where, you know, there might be something out there you're doing that's not filling you up like this might fill you up. Mm -hmm. It'll change everything. And you're a blessing to, to teach. All my wow. students are a blessing. You know, those that are, um, you know, um, short on ability in languages and those that are, you know, just really fireballs in language. It is an honor for me to teach all of them. And that doesn't have anything to do with it. So don't worry. Come as you are. Just, you know, just come and learn Hebrew. Amen. Thank you for having me. I'd love to come again because there's a lot more I'd like to talk about too. That sounds great to me. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> Many blessings. Thank you for joining us at Council Fire with the River. Shalom, shalom. Lehitrot. <laughs>